Hello, and welcome to my channel! Vice Rhino here! Today, we're going back to a channel that I haven't visited in a while, Brian Holdsworth. He's one of those apologists that I typically ignore because he strikes me as a bit of a condescending sophist. It's like he's aspiring to be as demeaning and incomprehensible as William Lane Craig is. Anyway, this is undoubtedly going to turn into a long video as I have to go out of my way to explain all of the various nuances of my position, lest he caveat my position right out of existence on my behalf. So let's just get right to it! Obviously, Atheists come in all shapes and sizes, and inevitably whenever I offer any kind of argument about atheism or against atheism, people will say, not all atheists believe that, not all atheists believe the same thing. That's a straw man argument. Credit where it's due, I'm glad you're acknowledging that, because all too frequently apologists do paint atheists with the same brush, and then describe them in ways that conjure images of comment section keyboard warriors who have put minimal thought into their position. Such oversimplification leads the Christians who are exposed to atheists underprepared to deal with the myriad of atheists that you will find out there in the real world, which tends to give me the impression that these oversimplifications are deliberately meant to get Christians to stop even thinking about the atheist position. It's all easily dismissed as thoughtless keyboard warrior nonsense, so just keep believing. And that's true, not all atheists believe the same thing, but a 10 minute YouTube video doesn't allow me to address every variation of atheism that exists. Which is why I like doing response videos. I don't need to address every variation of Christianity that exists, I just need to address the one that's being presented to me in the moment. It's also why I often do some cursory research into the people that I respond to before I begin scripting, so that I know not to talk about how ridiculous the idea that eight people survived a worldwide flood 4200 years ago is when I'm responding to someone who doesn't actually believe in a literal worldwide flood. But also, like, I know this isn't feasible for everyone, but YouTube doesn't cap your videos at 10 minutes. I would be fucking screwed if they did that. You arbitrarily putting a limit on yourself like that is not an excuse for overgeneralization. Nor is it my goal to refute every instance of that common creed. Instead, I'm simply trying to address people who subscribe to a popular form of atheism, especially a kind that I interact with a lot on YouTube and that I see on certain channels, and to invite them to reconsider the logical coherence of their position. And thus we leave the credit where it's due realm. It's kind of counterproductive to acknowledge the existence of a diversity of beliefs among atheists, only to follow that up with essentially, but this is the general form of atheism that you're going to encounter online. To avoid that, try a response video like I'm doing here. Now, through the magic of having watched ahead before scripting, I know that you're going to essentially get to the moral argument in this video. So if you want to address a specific form of atheism, there's plenty of content out there that you could respond directly to on this subject. So if you did that, then you would be addressing things that actual atheists are really saying, and thus avoid even the possibility of being told you're straw manning people. And if what I describe doesn't align with your particular form of atheism, then you can be confident that I'm not addressing you, and then therefore there's no need to be defensive. If you encounter defensive atheists too frequently, consider being less condescending. Like, I'm not just saying this to get jabs in, though I am saying it to get jabs in, but you come across as a holier-than-thou, know-it-all sesquipedalian. That sort of presentation style is going to raise some hackles no matter what you're saying. Just talking about it, my hackles are halfway up. Uh, mine are straight up. It rankles my hackles. So the particular kind of atheism that I'm addressing in this video is the kind that says that only what can be materially observed and empirically measured is real, and that if you want to assert anything as true, that is the kind of evidence that you need to provide. So yeah, I could see how comment section fights could give him the impression that that's the most common form of atheism. Uh, certainly there will be plenty of atheists who will say things like, if you can't provide empirical evidence it's not true, or something along those lines. But in my experience, this attitude is not so much only materialistic empirically verifiable things exist, but rather materialistic empirically verifiable things are the only types of things that can be reasonably demonstrated to exist. 
It's a fine distinction, but it is a distinction nonetheless. I think if you sat down and had an actual conversation with the sort of atheist that you're describing, you're likely to, at some point, hear them say that they can't prove that something immaterial with no empirically verifiable evidence supporting it does not exist, but we have no reason to think that anything like that does exist. And for me, I can't even conceptualize how one would go about proving the existence of something immaterial without empirically verifiable evidence. So until such a test can be devised, we may as well act as though the material world is all there is, because apparently it is all there is. And it's on those kinds of grounds that they accuse religious believers of being superstitious for not being able to provide empirical evidence for our religious claims. Well, one of the definitions of superstition is a widely held but unjustified belief in supernatural causation leading to certain consequences of an action or event, or a practice based on such a belief. So if you are admitting that you can't verify the existence of your supernatural immaterial beings, and you have practices that you base on your belief in those beings, like say, taking communion or going to mass, then that's pretty much superstitious by definition. So it's this kind of atheist that I address this question to. So the kind of atheist that doesn't actually exist very frequently, but is being presented as the most common kind of atheist based on an oversimplified straw man of the position? Does this mean I can just end the video here? I'm definitely the type of atheist he meant to include in that, but through a weird combination of oversimplification and excessive caveating, he basically made sure that no atheist who has done any significant amount of thought about their position will be included in his definition of an atheist. Because I just don't think that they can answer it. I've done a lot of searching myself to see, are there atheists out there? Are there commentators? Are there even scholars who answer this? And I don't seem to be able to find one that is satisfying. You do recognize that there's a difference between not being able to answer a question and not being satisfied with the answer, right? One is a thing that can be objectively determined, the other is your subjective opinion about the quality of the answer. And knowing the question that's coming up, I can say definitively that yes, plenty of atheists have answered this question, myself included. So let's have it out with the question. The question is, is slavery wrong? Yes, always and unequivocally. There, I answered it. You might not be satisfied with my answer for some reason, but that's a you problem. And the reason I ask that question is because virtually all respectable people will frantically trip over themselves to be the first to affirm that, yeah, it's wrong. Slavery is definitely wrong. So there you go. By your own admission, the title of your video is a lie. Atheists can and do answer this question, frequently and easily. In fact, it's usually easier for an atheist to answer this question than for a Christian, because the Bible explicitly condones slavery both in the Old and New Testaments, saying things like, slaves in reverent fear of God submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh in 1 Peter 2.18, and Leviticus 25 giving instructions as to who the Israelites are allowed to buy as chattel slaves that can be handed down to their children as inherited property. So the Christian is stuck trying to justify the Bible's approval of the practice of slavery, while the atheist is free to just say, no nah, man, it's wrong. And I even hear many atheists accuse the Bible of being morally inferior for not going far enough in its condemnations of slavery. No, Brian. It's not that the Bible doesn't go far enough in its condemnations of slavery. It's that it doesn't condemn slavery at all, ever and it explicitly condones it on a number of occasions. In addition to all the verses saying where you're allowed to buy slaves, who's a permanent slave and who's a temporary slave, and ordering slaves to obey their masters even when they're cruel, Jesus also told parables on a number of occasions where the stand-in for God was a good slave master, and the Christians were the slaves. The slaves who did the best work for their master are the good ones, and the ones who did not are the bad, lazy ones. Jesus could have said, don't own slaves at any point in his ministry, but instead he used the institution of slavery as a metaphor for God's relationship to us, implying that the slave masters are good figures that are to be respected and revered. Now, sure, Paul wrote a letter to Philemon asking him to free one slave one time. Sure, 1 Corinthians 7.21 says that slaves should gain their freedom if possible. But Paul advocating for the freeing of one specific slave is not a condemnation of the institution of slavery, and the verse telling slaves to seek their freedom starts by saying to not let it trouble you that you are a slave, and is followed up by a verse stating that each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. 
So yeah, like I said, I wouldn't say that the Bible doesn't go far enough in its condemnations of slavery. I would say that the Bible explicitly condones slavery and never condemns it. But I don't think that the atheist of the variety that I described earlier can answer this question sufficiently. Why, pray tell, is yes, slavery is wrong, insufficient? I'm sure you're gonna quibble with the reasoning about how we come to that answer, but whether you agree or disagree with the reasoning, that is an answer, and it is the answer that the vast majority of atheists will give, so why is that insufficient? By that, I don't mean that they don't have answers, just that their answers are illogical, and that they expose an inconsistency in the kinds of evidence that they demand of others to account for their beliefs. You know, Brian, there is a distinction between I won't believe your claim without empirically verifiable evidence and questions of morality. Now, that said, it's pretty easy to empirically demonstrate that slavery is harmful. Need I go over the numerous examples of cruelty and barbarism carried out by slave owners, not just in the form of bodily harm, but also in the separating of families, the selling of children, using children who were too young to understand what they were doing as spies against their families, and so on? All of this is empirically verified. But again, I do just want to drive home that there's a huge difference between we can see that slavery causes harm, so let's not do it, and gay people shouldn't be allowed to get married because the god that I believe in says it's bad, and even though all the research says it's better to let them get married, everyone needs to act in accordance with my beliefs about god, regardless of whether or not they believe in the same god as me. Because if you're going to logically account for the truth of a statement, a statement like, slavery is wrong, you have to be able to define the terms of that statement. Okay, but you said you were addressing people who are concerned about empirical verification, not logical verification. The definition of empirical is based on, concerned with, or verifiable by observation or experience, rather than theory or pure logic. So while logic can and does play a role, it's not the linchpin in the statement slavery is wrong. Slavery is easy enough to define, so I'm not going to spend any time on that. Well, that's interesting, because in my experience, Christians really do need to spend time arguing about the definition of slavery in order to make the Bible seem less pro-slavery than it actually is, arguing that indentured servitude doesn't count as slavery, and ignoring the fact that even if we grant that being a temporary slave doesn't technically count as being a slave, the Bible still explicitly condones chattel slavery. And actually, again, from the magic of having watched ahead, I can tell you that we're going to circle back around to this one. There's a reason he's not defining slavery here. But the word wrong is one that I've never heard defined in a way that is consistent with atheism. Wrong. Adjective. Unjust, dishonest, or immoral. I see nothing there that's inconsistent with atheism. Because if you're going to define something logically, you cannot include the thing that you're trying to define in your definition. That would be circular reasoning, and therefore fallacious. Well, it depends how you're going about doing that. At their core, most definitions are circular, and rely on certain inherent knowledge that a person has in order to convey the meaning of the word being looked up. It's just a matter of degree. A simple circular definition can be something like object, a thing. Thing, an entity, entity, an object. That is a circular definition chain with a depth of three. And eventually, with most things linguistic, you have to wind up back at something that is essentially a synonym of the word being described, but one that is already understood by the reader. And yeah, sometimes you can go pretty deep into definitions before you hit that point of circularity, but dictionaries would be useless if you didn't get there eventually. But being a circular definition does not inherently make that definition fallacious. Amusingly, on the website logicallyfallacious.com, when you look up circular definition, it explains that a circular definition is not inherently logically fallacious, because sometimes enough new information is given in the follow-up definitions. And the example it gives for this is the definition of ethics. For example, if I asked you, what is a honeybee? And you said, well, it's a bee-like creature that makes honey. I would be fully within my rights to accuse you of failing to answer my question. No, see, that, that's actually one of those instances where a circular definition is perfectly acceptable. If you already know what a bee is, and you already know what honey is, but you don't know what a honey bee is, then defining honey bee as a bee that makes honey answers the question perfectly. And this is actually a really fun example for me, because my partner has a four-year-old who does in fact know what bees are, and also knows what honey is, and recently asked me about the making of honey in a way that included the question, what is a honey bee? 
Not only is that exactly how I answered that question, but that answer imparted new knowledge into their four-year-old brain in a way that helped them accurately understand what a honeybee is. So this is a great example of a circular definition that is not fallacious and is perfectly acceptable. All you said is that a bee is a bee. No, not at all. You said that honey comes from bees, and the specific type of bee that honey comes from is the honeybee. If you already know what a bee is, then that is a perfectly acceptable answer. And amusingly, when you ask Google for the definition of bee, the first definition it gives is a honeybee. The second definition even includes a reference to a honeybee. So while that is most definitely a circular definition, it seems like the people over at Oxford Language don't have a problem with it. And that's obvious enough. But what's also true is that we can't use undefined synonyms in our definitions of a thing either. Why not? Every definition will appeal to synonyms to get their meaning across. That's the whole point of a definition. Sure, it won't likely be a single word synonym, but it will be a collection of words that means the same thing, but are said differently. The definition of synonym is a word or phrase that means exactly or nearly the same as another word or phrase in the same language. By this definition, a definition literally cannot be anything but a synonym for the word being defined. So if you asked me, what is a cat? And I said, well, a cat is a feline creature that humans have a disordered amount of affection for. Well, feline is just a synonym for cat. So all I've said again is a cat is a cat, which does nothing to define what it is. It just keeps us going in circles. That's literally how definitions work. Except in this case, you're not even doing it, right? Because you seem to be referring specifically to the species Felis catus when you say cat. Felis catus. Is your taxonomic nomenclature an endothermic quadruped, carnivorous by nature? While the term feline can refer to any number of other species in the cat family. Though amusingly, once again, the people at Oxford Language don't see a problem with using synonyms, as one of their definitions for feline is literally a cat or other member of the cat family. And unfortunately, every time I've heard an atheist give an account for morality, which then allows them to use words like right and wrong logically and coherently, this is the exact thing that they do. Like one article I read said that morality is simply whatever prevents suffering and increases well-being. I'm curious how you're gonna claim that to be circular. I mean, that's not quite the definition that I would use, but I see nothing inherently wrong with it. But all they've done, according to this definition, is made suffering synonymous with evil and well-being synonymous with goodness, never really defining any of them. Yeah, <sighs> okay, you're turning it into a circular definition by resorting to the fact that all definitions involve an appeal to synonyms. But here's the thing. A definition is usually descriptive rather than prescriptive. Prescriptive definitions have their place, scientific journals for instance, but when you ask me to define morality, I'm providing you with a definition that describes what I mean when I use the word morality. And if I mean decreasing suffering and increasing well-being, then as long as you understand these concepts, you now understand what I mean when I say morality. If you don't understand those concepts, then we can define them for you as well. I wonder what your definition of morality will be that completely avoids the use of synonyms. Spoiler, he doesn't have one. And furthermore, they're not even accurate synonyms. So your problem with this definition of morality is that it relies on synonyms to make its definition, but then you go on to say that they're not actually synonyms? Okay, if they're not synonyms, then we have a definition that doesn't rely on synonyms and so is not circular by your definition of a circular definition. Suffering isn't simply wrong or evil. In fact, I can think of all kinds of instances in which varying degrees of suffering can produce something that is widely considered good. And that's why I said it wasn't quite the definition that I would use. I would use the terms net suffering and net well-being, meaning that when you weigh the suffering caused by a given action against the well-being brought about by that same action, if the end result is an increase in well-being, then that action can be considered moral. Of course, this does leave me open to attack from the idea that maybe something like genocide could bring about greater well-being than suffering experienced by the victims of the genocide, and so genocide could be morally justified. But the problem here is mainly one of foreknowledge. Every instance we've seen in history of a genocide has resulted in a much greater increase of suffering than whatever well-being was obtained. Hypothetically, I suppose it's possible that a group of people will somehow in the future cause enough harm to others to justify wiping them out, but that has not been our experience, and we cannot possibly have the foreknowledge necessary to make that determination. So pragmatically speaking, we can say that genocide is morally wrong is a moral absolute. 
However, when we look at examples like vaccinations, yeah, it hurts to get a needle stuck in your arm. But that momentary pinprick and slight immune response that gives you a sore arm and maybe have you feeling under the weather for a few days is nowhere near as bad as getting the disease that you're being immunized against. And being immunized is likely to make that disease milder for you even if you do end up getting it. Like, my kids have never had chicken pox. I don't know anyone with kids the same age as mine who have had their kids get chicken pox. I remember getting chicken pox as a kid myself. It sucked big time. I would much rather have taken a shot than gone through that week of itchy hell. So vaccinations are a good thing even though they cause a little bit of harm when you administer them. Such as like chemotherapy or surgery. Exercise is almost universally recognized as a good thing in the right place and at the right time. But the first time I went running as a way to get back in shape, the experience was so unpleasant for me that I nearly threw up. Yeah, see, you're supposed to ease yourself in by degrees. You probably did more harm to yourself than the benefit of that particular run. In fact, too much running can actually increase your chances of having a heart attack, though at the same time it increases your chances of surviving it over someone who is sedentary, but that's beside the point. The kicker with this one is that if you are the only person that is affected by one of your actions, then that action is morally neutral. Endurance runners are more likely to have heart attacks than the general population, but I would not say that becoming an endurance runner is immoral. By the same token, eating a bunch of chips will also increase your chances of having a heart attack. Yet I don't think I'm being immoral when I pick up a bag of chips at the store that I know I'm going to eat way too quickly. Self-sacrifice and self-denial seem to me to be traits that most people recognize as being honorable, but almost always introduce a degree of suffering. But again, adding the word net to a couple places in the definition accounts for this perfectly. Self-sacrifice in service of others is about suffering yourself in order to increase the well-being of other people. This is why there's a common trope in movies of making one of your fallen comrades' deaths mean something. If we don't accomplish our goal, then so-and-so died for nothing. They're trying to make the increased well-being that would come about as a result of whatever that person died for happen, so that the death can be seen as, maybe not a good thing, but at least worth the sacrifice that they made. We have monuments in virtually every city where I live uh, commemorating those who died in the wars of the 20th century. So was it wrong for them to suffer and die for those causes? I would argue that in the vast majority of cases, yes, war has always been about the powerful rulers using common people as cannon fodder in an attempt to increase or maintain their power. Certainly there can be justification in the case of defensive wars, World War II being the obvious go-to example here, but ultimately war usually boils down to politicians sending people to die in order to advance their political agenda. And I have no problem saying that that's usually a bad thing. So it seems that not only is morality and right and wrong not defined by that definition, the synonyms that they attempt to smuggle in as substitutes for the terms that they are trying to define in a circular way aren't even good synonyms. Is it really trying to smuggle synonyms in if the synonyms aren't actually synonyms? Like, we define morality in terms of those words. By your admission, those words are not synonyms for morality. Ergo, the definition is not circular based on your ridiculous definition of a circular definition. Many, many others have tried to argue that morality is simply what has been agreed upon as a social contract which can accumulate into something like a legal system or the law. A social contract can be one way of looking at morality, yeah, but I wouldn't define morality based on what is legal, and I doubt anyone who puts forward a definition of morality based on a social contract would either. But this begs for a definition of the social contract or the law. If you reply that the social contract is an agreement about what is right and wrong, then all you've done is made the social contract or the law synonymous with morality, and again, you're back to arguing in circles. But again, definitions are definitionally synonymous. And again again, I doubt very much that you would agree that morality is based on a social contract, so you probably also don't agree that this social contract is actually synonymous with morality, so you're either left with a non-circular definition, or you agree that morality is synonymous with a social contract. If I ask you what is morality, and you say that it's the social contract about what is right and wrong, or the law, and I follow up by asking, okay, can you define what the law is? And you say, it's a series of documented statements about what is right and wrong. But I know of nobody who holds to the idea of morality as a social contract who would also agree that the law is an accurate representation of morality. 
In fact, if you actually look into the matter, you'll find that there's little consensus among legal scholars about what the definition of the law even is. I'll leave a link here to a philosophy tube video that begins by going into that in more detail than I'm willing to do here. Do you not see how we're just going in circles without ever defining any of the things that we're talking about? I see how you're doing that, yeah, but I feel like the only thing I've been doing so far is flashing definitions on the screen. It's kind of annoying, to be honest. Furthermore, it fails to account how we can judge one instance of a social contract or a legal system against another. Which is why I prefer the net well-being versus net harm definition of morality, as that allows us to measure which social contracts throughout history have increased well-being and which have increased harm, and to what degrees. How can we say that the legal system that allows slavery are bad, and the legal systems that prevent it are good, unless morality somehow sits outside and above legal systems and social contracts? Easy, with the well-being and harm definitions. Slavery as an institution greatly increases harm, far more than it increases well-being for the people who benefit from it. Ergo, slavery as an institution is immoral, and so were the legal systems that permitted it, including the one laid out in the Bible. Because that's the question that's being asked here. Is slavery wrong? Are systems that allow slavery wrong? Yes. Yes, they are. And I notice that you haven't answered that question yourself. Curious, isn't it? I'm not asking, do some people create legal systems that outlaw it? Obviously, that's a question that doesn't need to be asked. The question is, ought it to be against the law for the sake of what is morally good? Yes, it ought to be against the law because of the harm versus well-being thing. So again, not only is the social contract theory fallacious for using circular reasoning, it doesn't even use a well-thought-out substitute for morality. I really don't understand how you can keep reiterating that it's circular for using synonyms, and then follow that up immediately by pointing out that you don't actually think they are synonyms. Pick a lane. And the reason we always end up with these absurdities is because morality can't be accounted for empirically without obscuring it behind some poorly assessed substitute, which is by definition circular reasoning. Well, the uncomfortable truth of the matter is that no matter what rational basis for morality we come up with, it is ultimately based entirely on our feelings. And this is actually another reason I prefer the suffering or harm versus well-being definition of morality. Pretty much universally, people will agree that they prefer to suffer less and increase their well-being. So while we can, and do, have argument after argument about how to accomplish that goal, it's something that almost everyone can at least agree is a good thing, even if they don't think it's the definition of morality. Now, this doesn't make the definition of morality circular reasoning, it does make it post hoc but I don't see a problem with that when it comes to morality. We can empirically measure the increase or decrease in harm or well-being, so if we agree to that as the definition of morality, then morality is empirical by definition. The fact that we're defining it as morality in a post hoc manner doesn't invalidate the definition. As with synonyms, definitions are pretty much all post hoc. The language evolved rather arbitrarily, and through a social contract we agreed what the words of the language meant, and then wrote down the definitions to describe those meanings, with the definitions changing as the way the language is used changes. So that definition of morality is post hoc, just like all definitions are. And it is empirically measurable, so there's no problem with it not fitting into an empiricist worldview. And which always offers a substitute that falls absurdly short of whatever it is that we mean by morality. Well, what people usually mean by morality is their feelings about moral situations that are largely shaped by the culture they grew up in. But that's something that most people aren't comfortable with. And actually, again, there is more to it than that. That's a view of morality called sentimentalism, but not all moral philosophers agree on that point. At the end of the day, moral philosophers can't even agree on a definition of morality, so the fact that you're out here saying that you don't think atheists can answer the question, is slavery wrong, because you disagree with how atheists define morality, just shows that you have a very limited view of moral philosophy. Like, do you think that most moral philosophers would not take the view that slavery is wrong? Do you think that any moral philosophers that take a different view on the definition of morality than you do cannot adequately answer the question even if they aren't atheists? I've given my own personal views on the matter, but I acknowledge that the origin and nature of morality is by no means a settled question. To treat it as such is to shut yourself off from any potential new developments in moral philosophy that might shed more light on the subject. So an atheist can't actually say that anything by that measure is right or wrong and truly mean 
what they're saying without sacrificing their own logical consistency. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that an atheist can't be moral or that they don't have a moral conscience. What I am saying is that they can't account for that morality logically. And on that point, you're just wrong. You couldn't even be consistent with your own definition of circular definitions when you attempted to make that point. But even so, regardless of your definition of morality, you claimed that is slavery wrong is a question that atheists can't answer. We can and do frequently. You just don't like how we get there. That doesn't mean we didn't answer it. For them, it's something like social conditioning or just feelings about something. But whatever it is, it's not rational. What's not rational about the increased well-being and minimized suffering definition? Sure, you don't seem to think that there's a connection between well-being and good, or suffering and bad, but the connection is there. Worst case scenario, it's an arbitrary connection, and in reality that actually does seem to be the case. We don't like suffering, so we call it bad. We like it when our well-being increases, so we call that good. But that's the thing about morality. It's dependent on the existence of moral agents, beings that are capable of reflecting on their actions and considering potential consequences of actions that have not yet been taken. Morality is based on our opinion, because if there were no beings in existence with moral agency to have opinions on morality, morality itself would cease to exist as a concept. We don't call the massive storm on Jupiter bad, but when a hurricane hits an area where people live and causes them harm, we do call that hurricane bad because we can empathize with the people affected by it. We know that they are suffering because of it. Objectively speaking, the storm on Jupiter is way more severe than even the worst hurricane ever seen on Earth. But because no moral agents are affected by that storm, we do not assign any moral labels to it. If we're trying to approach morality without consideration for emotion, this is entirely arbitrary. It makes no sense to call a comparatively minor storm on Earth bad, but to not apply any moral language to an objectively more severe storm on Jupiter. But as soon as you consider human emotions, it makes perfect sense. Now at this point, it might be fair to demand of me the thing that I've been asking atheists for, which is, what's my definition of morality? Excellent. I've been waiting for this. Let's see if he can define it without running afoul of his definition of a circular definition. So morality is a standard of truth that gives us the ability to apprehend potential alternative thoughts actions and scenarios, and to make judgments about them that express either approval or disapproval when compared to that standard. Oh, I'm so sorry, Brian, but that's a circular definition. You see, all you've ended up saying there is that the standard of truth is morality. So if we swap out the synonyms, what we're left with is morality is morality. The whole judging things such that we can compare it to the standard and either approve or disapprove was just superfluous sophistry. With any definition of morality, there is the implication that actions can be judged to be moral or immoral in accordance with the definition. But nitpicking about synonyms and sophistry aside, that's almost exactly the same as increase well-being and decrease harm. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that increasing well-being and decreasing harm is the better definition here, because in that definition of morality, the standard by which we are judging actions to be either moral or immoral is right there in the definition, whereas your definition makes a vague reference to a standard of truth without saying what that standard is. I could easily co-opt that to say that if it is true that an action will increase suffering and decrease well-being, that action is immoral, using the well-being suffering measurement as the standard of truth. I'm sure you're about to claim that God is the standard of truth that we should be measuring against, but this is once again where we run into the issue where you think there's a double standard with regards to morality. You believe certain things to be immoral based on what the church has declared to be immoral, with this moral authority supposedly coming directly from God. But why should we trust such an authority if that authority cannot be empirically demonstrated to exist? When I use a measurement of suffering and well-being to define morality, suffering and well-being are empirically measurable things. I'm not appealing to something external that can't be shown to exist, and worse, we only know what this supposed source of truth says is moral or immoral based on what people in positions of authority and with a vested interest in maintaining their control say about it. Given these options, it seems like the one where people are capable of making moral decisions on their own without reliance on authority is the more rational one, and is less likely to wind up with the authority abusing their power for their own benefit, such as, say, sending your followers off on crusades or something, as a random example that has no bearing on this video whatsoever. Such judgments appear in statements like, that ought to happen, and that ought not to happen, or more precisely, that ought to be, 
and that ought not to be. Yeah, and such statements are actually really easy to make when using suffering and well-being as the moral measuring stick. In other words, we are making judgments of an ontological and metaphysical nature, which are inquiries about being and existence. Okay, but it's possible to ground those claims empirically using suffering and well-being as the moral measuring stick. When you use unsubstantiated claims about a god and what that god does or doesn't want, and then demand that people who don't believe in that god also behave in the way that that god wants, then we start having issues. These aren't questions about what does happen, they're questions about what ought to happen. Because what ought to happen doesn't always happen. There's actually a surprising amount to break down here. He's essentially referring to Hume's is-ought problem, where philosopher David Hume stated that you cannot derive an ought from an is. That is, you cannot make statements about how you ought to behave or what ought to happen based purely on factual statements about what is. But as moral philosophers have pointed out since Hume's time, this can in fact be done in light of a goal. If agent A wishes to achieve goal B, A reasonably ought to do action C. In the case of morality, if we can agree that increasing well-being and decreasing suffering is the goal, then we can determine what ought to be done in furtherance of that goal. Now, sure, the world is a big, complicated, messy place, and as such there will often be disagreement about how to go about doing that, but the fact remains that, in light of a goal or objective, you can derive an ought from an is. Now, the goal itself may be said to be arbitrary, a mere matter of preferences, but this brings us back to the whole existence of moral agents thing. Morality is, at its core, subjective, no matter what moral philosophy you subscribe to. And this is because, without the existence of moral agents, morality itself would cease to exist. Is murder moral or immoral? Well, if there's nobody about to murder, or be murdered, or have an opinion on murder, it's a nonsensical question. Morality itself is dependent on the existence of subjects, and is therefore subjective, even if the subject that it is most dependent on is God. And the moral argument even implicitly admits this. The claim that without God objective moral values and duties do not exist makes morality subjective, just with God as the subject. The existence of morality, even if I grant that God is what makes morality possible, is still dependent upon the subject that is God. Morality is not itself objective, as if God ceases to exist, morality would also cease to exist under this view. Now, since all moral systems are at their core subjective because of their dependence on the existence of subjects, why should we ignore the subjective opinions of the subjects who are most impacted by morality? The vast majority of these subjects will agree that they would prefer to increase their own well-being and decrease their own suffering, and so they would see someone doing something to increase their suffering as bad, and someone doing something to increase their well-being as good. So why would the same not be true at the societal level? Thus, the suffering and well-being metric is a good one by which to measure morality, even using your definition of morality, while morality by divine command has historically led to great increases in suffering and so isn't a great option to measure morality against. For example, slavery happens, and is happening right now in the world around us. And if we say that's wrong, we're saying it ought not to happen. Yes, slavery results in a net increase in suffering. So if our goal is to reduce net suffering and increase net well-being, then to achieve that goal, slavery ought to be abolished. Now, credit where it's due, in my experience most apologists ignore the very real fact that slavery is an ongoing human rights issue throughout the world, so kudos for acknowledging that fact. But the fact remains that with secular morality based on the suffering well-being goal, we can say for a fact that slavery is wrong. But in Christianity, we have to contend with the fact that the word of God commands slaves to obey their earthly masters. So Brian, I ask you, is slavery wrong? Can you answer that question without a bunch of caveats? But if we only take our moral understanding from that which can be observed and measured empirically, then there is no question of what ought to be, only what is, because only what is is what can be measured and inquired about in this way. Yada 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 goals, blah blah blah. I've already dealt with this point, moving on. Which is why the physical sciences can't tell us that slavery is wrong. They can only tell us that it is, it exists, it has being. Okay. Why are we talking about the physical sciences at this point? I mean, I guess technically you could say that biology can tell us that slavery is wrong due to the actual physical harm that happens to the slaves in most instances, but like, I'm not expecting there to be a mathematical equation with slavery is wrong on one side of the equal sign. And to make such statements, you have to offer evidence of a metaphysical and a theological nature because there is no physical evidence available to you. Why theological? Why are you trying to sneak theology in there? 
Are you that unimaginative that you are completely incapable of picturing a moral system that is unrelated to the existence of God? I mean, I guess that's what this whole video is about, after all. Which is why it's no wonder that slavery, which virtually disappeared in Christendom in the Middle Ages, started to resurge in Western civilization at exactly the time when secularism started to gain momentum and influence. Remember at the beginning when I said we'd circle back around to the definition of slavery? Yeah, this is why. Because Brian's being a touch dishonest here, maybe more than a touch. Slavery didn't disappear under the auspices of the church and only reemerge as those godless secularists started gaining ground. That is 19th century apologetic propaganda. First, the medieval period was marked by economic systems like serfdom and feudalism. While a landowner's serfs were not slaves in the sense that they could be bought or sold, though in some places they could be, they were still people who were forced to work without being paid. I mean, I guess they were technically paid by given a place to live and permission to work extra for their own subsistence. But serfdom actually evolved specifically out of the Roman institution of slavery. But even if we don't consider serfs to have been slaves, slavery was still alive and well in medieval Europe. To quote Hannah Barker, assistant professor of history at Arizona State University and someone who specializes in slavery in medieval Europe, common knowledge would have it that slavery did not exist in medieval Europe. However, there is a thriving body of scholarship which demonstrates that slavery was practiced widely in various forms in Europe during the Middle Ages, alongside captivity, serfdom, and other types of unfreedom. Them. Where then did the common knowledge come from? In the first instance, it derives in the late 18th and 19th century abolitionist assumption that, as Christianity spread through Europe during the Middle Ages, it must surely have driven out slavery. Among scholars, this common knowledge is sometimes reinforced by Marxist historical narratives, according to which slavery was the mode of production characteristic of the Roman period, while serfdom characterized the medieval period. Yet into the 14th and 15th centuries, medieval Europeans continued to own slaves, trade in slaves, and enslave each other as well as non-European others. But not only are you wrong about slavery being virtually non-existent under Christendom in the Middle Ages, you're wrong about the increasing popularity of secularism being the cause of its resurgence. Prominent Enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, and Adam Smith were against slavery for varying reasons. Revolutionary France, often demonized by apologists for being atheistic and secular, outlawed slavery in 1794, though Napoleon did reinstitute it in 1804. The first country to abolish slavery, Denmark, did so in 1792 when Frederick VI became regent and initiated reforms inspired by Enlightenment principles, which also included the elimination of serfdom. Now, of course, you can find abolitionists of the Enlightenment era who advocated against slavery based on their Christian faith, but louder than them were the voices arguing for slavery also based on their Christian faith. The institution of slavery in the Americas was vigorously defended on religious grounds, and in the United States in particular, the man largely credited with emancipating the slaves, Abe Lincoln, was often attacked in the press with accusations of him not being a Christian, and the only public statement he made about it was, quote, that I am not a member of any Christian church is true, but I have never denied the truth of scriptures, and I have never spoken with intentional disrespect of religion in general, or any denominations of Christians in particular. So the closest he ever came to professing himself to be a Christian was to say, I'm not a member of any Christian church, but I didn't technically say Christianity is wrong. So yeah, all this to say that crediting Christianity with slavery's absence in medieval Europe and blaming secularism for its re-emergence is complete and utter bullshit. Now, can you find Enlightenment thinkers who were pro-slavery? Yes. Of course you can. But ultimately, the Enlightenment marks the beginning of the era when society started to view slavery as wrong and began eliminating it, and this did not happen under the guidance of the church. The slave trade that we tend to think of and universally condemn really only got going during the scientific, secular, and Enlightenment era. The particular instantiation of the institution of slavery that you're talking about did originate around the same time as the Enlightenment began, though notably the Atlantic slave trade had its beginnings in the 1500s, and the Enlightenment is generally agreed to have started in the 1600s, so the idea that the Enlightenment caused the Atlantic slave trade seems more than a bit off. Historically speaking, though, those are fairly close events, but it's important to note here that he's speaking specifically of the Atlantic slave trade, which led to American slavery, which most of both of our audiences will be more familiar with than other instances of slavery, just because of geography. Most of both of our audiences are located in North America. Well, I mean, I'm assuming this is also true of Brian. I don't have access to his analytics, but it's a fairly safe assumption. So why do we think the Atlantic slave trade started in the early 1500s? Could it 
possibly have anything to do with the fact that Europeans didn't cross the Atlantic until the late 1400s, and so wouldn't have crossed the Atlantic to trade slaves at that time? Timing-wise, it seems like the Atlantic slave trade pretty much began as soon as Europeans started crossing the Atlantic, which would imply that there was already slave trading going on, and the crossing of the Atlantic simply opened up a new market. And given that slavery was alive and well all throughout medieval Europe, I see no reason why we should connect the Atlantic slave trade with the Enlightenment rather than just seeing it as a continuation of the European slave trade as Europeans expanded to new locations. Like, if you're going to blame the Atlantic slave trade on the Enlightenment, then you may as well also credit the Enlightenment for the discovery of the Americas by the non-Nordic Europeans. In the ancient world, slavery abounded everywhere. The Roman Empire was built on the backs of slaves. And then the Roman institution of slavery evolved into medieval serfdom that was, at the very least, tolerated, but more than likely encouraged by the church. European society was built on the backs of slaves and serfs, who were another type of slave, basically. It was exactly at this time when we stopped measuring the human soul as an essential ingredient in a person's humanity and reduced that inqu inquiry about what a human being is to only what can be physically measured, only what the sciences can tell us. And when they did that, they found that human beings are far from being equal. Hold up there, buddy. Did you really just make the jump to scientific racism? Like, yeah, Europeans saw other people groups as inferior, but when you actually approach the nature of humanity from a scientific perspective, what you find is that there are no significant differences between people groups other than superficial ones. People who use science to promote racism are, as it turns out, misusing science. A great example of this is the book The Bell Curve. The authors of that book had to go out of their way to misrepresent the research they were using in order to draw unjustified conclusions. I'll leave a link to a great video on Sean's channel that does an in-depth look into just how they got the results that they wanted in The Bell Curve, and what the data actually shows. Some are bigger, some are stronger, some are smarter, some are more beautiful, some are more agreeable, and more capable than others. Combine this with theories about natural selection and survival of the fittest, and you have the perfect recipe to say some people should dominate others, and some people should be utterly subservient to others. Holy fucking shit. I thought for sure he was going to end that by pointing out that those views are mistaken, but he seems to actually be under the impression that all that racist bullshit that he just spewed is actually true, and given its truth, the application of social Darwinism leads society to endorse slavery. Like, wow, I don't even know what to say here. Like, holy shit, man. It is only when we account for the human soul, a thing more precious than the entire known universe, that we can then say that all men are equal, for they all carry the dignity of the divine image imprinted on that soul. Yeah, you had a chance to kind of save that there if you would just like acknowledge that none of what you said earlier is true, and then you could have tried to put a Christian spin on it by appealing to the image of God as to how we know that none of that is true. But instead, he just carries on with him having heavily implied that those differences are real, but that we shouldn't use them as reasons to have slavery because of the image of God. Okay, I made a lot of jokes about the magic of having watched ahead in this one, but this is pretty close to the end, so I stopped before I got here. I was genuinely shocked by this. I mean, Brian is a Catholic, meaning that he advocates in favor of an organization that is known for harboring pedophiles, and which has been caught time and time again abusing its authority in order to increase its own wealth and power. Um, like, Catholic anti-Semitism almost got a dishonorable mention earlier when talking about medieval slavery, because Jews living in church-controlled medieval Europe frequently suffered severe persecution at the hands of the church. In fact, if we want to go ahead and hit Godwin's law for this video, a lot of the anti-Semitic practices instituted by the Nazis were directly taken from Catholic practices in medieval Europe, such as making Jews wear a yellow badge that identifies them as Jewish, and distributing propaganda accusing them of blood libel, saying that they sacrifice children in order to get blood for their unleavened bread. I was going to try and spend this one focusing on what Brian is actually saying instead of the blatant immorality of the church that he advocates for, but honestly, at this point, I feel like his racist attitude there is nurtured by the church such that it's impossible to separate them, so it's worth pointing out that the people who are willing to publicly advocate for an organization known to be shitty are likely to be on the shitty side themselves. Okay, that's it for this one. Sorry for how that ended there, that was something else. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Luke H5495, who says, See, the thing about how porn is marketed these days is that you either die a teen or live long enough to see yourself become the MILF. And if you want the context on that one, check out episode 10 of my podcast with my partner, where we read through a Christian marriage book. 
Thanks for watching, I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I livestream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole, and I stream with my partner every Tuesday at 1pm Eastern here. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the synonyms that define my channel. If you'd like to be both circular and necessary for definitions, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! You come across as a holier-than-thou, know-it-all sesquipid... sesquipedalian. Sesqui sesquipedalian. It's not a word I normally use, because I'm not a sesquipedalian in, in real life. <laughs> Just in my videos. Breathe. Just breathe. <sighs>